Dante. Tom. Thanks for coming in. Thanks for having me. I was trying to think of how to start this podcast because to me, you're very unique in the sense that you're an athlete, a competitor, a coach, and you do instructionals on strength conditioning. Mm -hmm. So for me, there's so many avenues to go in, but I'm so fascinated with what a professional grappler is because from someone who doesn't know a whole lot compared to what you know about your industry, this all seems really new. Mm -hmm. And is the term professional grappler more correct than a professional jujitsu player? What is the terminology and how have you ended up being a professional grappler? Yeah, I would say um, the Mm -hmm. term that I I think would kind of go across the board and kind of like have a general um, definition for us would be a professional professional submission grappler a professional submission wrestler you know some people say submission wrestling or submission grappling and that basically just uh, defines somebody who gets paid to compete who does it professionally they go to professional events and they are paid to compete they go to money tournaments and things like that so uh, what you said is 100 percent true it is a new thing it is a new thing in this in this sport Um, when we started the sport out it was pretty much you're competing for world titles and different things like that there's a couple tournaments that would pay money but nobody could really call themselves a professional athlete necessarily because we didn't make enough money or have enough brand, have enough recognition to be a a true professional. Mm -hmm. So um, I would say that that's changed in the last four to six years. It really has changed. What was that inflection point or the cause of, okay, we went from this recreational pastime more so Mm -hmm. in from what I see of it to now it's, a sport it holds its own it's got its own organizations the yeah. adcc seems like the last one was just phenomenal to watch on tv mm-hmm. what has caused this stir um so everybody has like different opinions i think um jiu-jitsu was first introduced mainstream probably in the beginning days of the ufc with the gracies um with uh submission wrestling with jiu-jitsu being so dominant in the beginning days of the ufc But I think the tournament and I think the kind of transition that started all of this was the Eddie Bravo Invitational. So this there was a tournament called EBI. It came out. It had a completely different rule set than everything else. It was submission only. Um, If it was tied at the end of the 10-minute match, you went into overtime. It was a lot like college football. So you started either in a submission or on your opponent's back. And if you submitted or escaped, that's how they determine the winner, by quickest submission or quickest escape time. So I think that was the thing that that kind of started it the most because a few reasons. It was on UFC Fight Pass. It had a really broad audience. You know, we didn't have flow grappling back in that time. We didn't have anything else. We had uh, these channels like Budo videos and things like this, which were pretty junk and uh, didn't get a lot of views, didn't have a lot of viewership. So that was one thing that made it huge. Another thing was, you know, Eddie Bravo and Joe Rogan are – really good friends. They're like boys and they train together. So uh, Eddie Bravo is a huge name in the sport, but the most powerful voice in jujitsu is Joe Rogan. You know, that's mm-hmm. what a lot of people don't understand that, you know, the, the, the Joe Rogan podcast is the, is the most powerful voice that we have in martial arts, you know? So when he is a huge advocate for jujitsu, he's a huge advocate for the Eddie Bravo Invitational and ADCC and flow grappling and all these events now. So when that came out, and you have Joe Rogan talking about it and pushing it and hyping his friend's event. I think that's what blew it up. And then we saw more athletes start to come out of the woodwork, like, you know, Gary Tunnan, Gordon Ryan, uh, the Dan or her squad. They started to come out and just strictly focus on the submission grappling, the submission only type um, events. And they were the first crop of uh, the professional grapplers because they would not do what we did going to the gi tournaments and the different kind of tournaments to collect titles. They were going after the money tournaments or the money matches. And then um, along with them, a small group of us from like my side of the sport kind of moved over. Mm -hmm. So pretty much once I moved over and started taking um, professional grappling matches and headlining professional cards, I pretty much uh, put the gi away and I put all that away and I'm kind of made that transition from amateur to professional athlete. It's so unique from a strength coach's perspective to see more and more content pop up for professional grappling. Yep. And now you have industry experts who are strength conditioning coaches for this area, mm-hmm. which is a sport which is so new. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, 
and just from again observing and i'm a i'm a nimrod when it comes to like what uh the history is of everything um in that you're paving the way for the next generation right that's what it yeah. seems how did you figure out how to become a professional well i think a, a big thing when i was coming up in the sport so i always use uh my experience with strength and conditioning, my experience with with weight training uh, as an example of this. So growing up when I was like nine, 10 years old, my dad introduced me to um, a gym, you know, taught me how to bench and different things like that. Just introduced me to it. Took me, took a summer to really like force it upon, not necessarily force it upon me, but, you know, get me in the gym, get me in there four or five days a week, show me the ropes, get me working out for a summer. And then he really never took me to the gym again. So by the time I found it myself, I already had the experience and the knowledge from what he taught me. But by the time I went back, I made the choice to go back. So I think that was a cool thing. But when I was starting out in jujitsu, I started when I was 12 years old. All I ever heard about was how lifting weights was bad for you. Lifting weights was wrong. That's not how these guys train. They train with natural movements, these natural gymnastics, these things like this. Um, which one, I didn't like to do, and two, it didn't really make a whole lot of sense because yeah. when we look at how they were built, they weren't built like people who did Hindu push-ups and Hindu squats all the time. They were built like people who used um, kind of a lot of the same techniques, a lot of the same principles that that we use nowadays. You know, they, they were very strong. They were very athletic. So um, it took a while to kind of stray away from the herd a little bit, and I think a big thing that that I really believed in was it's time to follow what these other sports are doing. Mm -hmm. If we want to be professional, we want to make money. Why aren't we following these other people who make millions of dollars? Why aren't we following these people, these trainers who train with million dollar athletes? These are the kind of people that we should be studying, seeing what we can take from them and apply to our sport because everything's very specific, but we can always take things from these other strength coaches, these other people and apply them in our sport, you know, yeah. and being in Ohio was easy for me to find West side, but this was the, the place that I saw had a really broad um, level of like athletes there. We had sprinters, had track athletes. We had football players, baseball players, fighters, all kinds of shit that we had here. So I was like, man, that's something that I can take something from and, mm -hmm. and you know, tailor to myself, tailor to my sport. So that's how I kind of landed upon it. I still think that it's, it's very underdeveloped in today's sport. Did you have a professional mindset from day one or did you graduate into that school of thinking when you got more involved into jujitsu? I would, I would say, uh, you always make changes the more you go on, you know, but I would say that in the beginning, jujitsu just had a, a very amateur, it, we all had a very amateur approach to it. You know, we did have an amateur approach to it. The way we trained, we had no science behind how we trained. Uh, we would literally come in the gym every day. We'd warm up for a little bit. We'd put the clock on and we would just beat the shit out of each other for eight or nine or 10 rounds a day. And we do it five days a week. And then we wondered why we didn't get any better. Mm -hmm. um, that was kind of like what we did. We didn't take any kind of uh, scientific approach to any of our training. We went in the gym, we maxed out in the weights, we maxed out on the mats, we maxed out when we did wrestling training or anything like that. So well, when it really changed is when money's getting involved and the level of competition is is rising the level of competition is is getting higher and higher the more eyes are on the sport the more money's being pumped into the sport uh things have to change mm -hmm. you know so you have to start adding more things into your sport so you have to start training more you have to start doing these different things and uh when you're hearing about athletes training two and three times a day and you're trying to wonder how does that happen you know if i train one session i feel like i'm dead but we shouldn't be training eight or nine rounds a day trying to kill mm -hmm. each other against guys. You know, we should be adjusting our training volume, um, implementing drills, implementing specific training, implementing uh, situational rounds rather than just all out sparring rounds. Because, you know, an all out sparring round is the exact same thing as uh, coming in the gym and maxing out on a squat or a deadlift. You know, that's not something we do all the time. So the more money, the more. Um, experience I had, I'd say I really started to adjust everything a lot more. In the beginning, even at the beginning of like my black belt career, I was very amateur in my approach. Is your approach now very specific around competitions, around the business side rather than 
the competitor side or is it a mix of both? Oh, so when we look at my gym, the, the gym is about um, how it can be beneficial for everyone. You know, my competition team is completely separate from the student body. You know, my competition training is at 930 in the morning and then my first adult classes are at, at noon. So they're away from them. You know, by the time that the first class comes in the gym, we're already in, hitting the showers and, mm -hmm. and getting ready to go home. So that's completely separate from them. Um, I would say that when I focus on the gym, I'm focusing on giving the best product, giving the best um, technique, ideas, kind of lifestyle uh, encouragement to people that I can that goes across the board to everybody of all ages, you know, and that's that's how I, I think a gym has to be. Um, if you want a gym that just has to be just for competitors, you're going to go broke really, really mm -hmm. quick, you know, because, you know, this guys who are trying to be professional athletes especially fighters we don't have we don't have a pot to piss in man we're always yeah. broke when we when we're starting out right so uh that's part of it but with competition i wouldn't say i'm so much focused on just competition i do have my goals and competitions i want to win but uh, the big focus is in improving is getting better and that wasn't a focus before it was always like this is my next competition i have to train really hard i have to win this mm -hmm. and you lose sight of a lot of things you know you lose sight of getting better you lose sight of improving yourself and it's only going to take so much time before you just get run down or before you get injured or before competition and and training your ass off just isn't that fun anymore you know you have to be able to train and see improvements and see developments and see your body changing see you know your mindset getting better if you're seeing those things it's going to be motivating and you're going to be able to keep doing this for you know 5 10 15 years is everything you've done coming from a small town outside was it where you're in Windsor or outside just outside, outside of Windsor, Windsor yeah i grew up in Harrow Ontario so a very small town coming from that um if I remember either read it or listening to it, you had a choice between golf and piano or fine and martial arts yeah. to get into that. Then you got into, you, your dad got you into jujitsu. Yep. And um, then you kept traveling over to America. Mm -hmm. The opening of your gym, and now you have gyms, was mm -hmm. everything in pursuit of you getting into full-time grappling? Was was that your plan or does it just naturally occur? Yeah, on everything was about being um, a competitor and having jujitsu be my life, you know, and um, for jujitsu to be my life, I would want to have a business with it that I always have a reason to do it. You know mm -hmm. what I mean? Um, a lot of times if you're just a competitor and you're attending a, a training facility, eventually at the end of your career, at the end of your, um, you know, career as you're healthy, uh, you might start to pull away from the gym. You know, family can bring you away from the gym, relationships, you know, illness, injuries, things like that. Now I don't really have a choice. I can't be away from the gym and that's just how I want it. You know, I just want it exactly like that. I always want to have a reason to be in the gym and I always want people to to count on me to to be there to help them. What's very, in that direct, there's so many things that are interesting is that even though you're relatively young, you're 27, mm -hmm. You started when you were 12. Yeah. So your training age is pretty freaking high. Yeah. In a uncharted discipline. And you're now the f part of the first frontier of full-time mm -hmm. grapplers, which is a very small group of people. Yeah, correct. for sure. Um, you've created your gym. You have two gyms, right? Yep. Um, is everything that you're learning, you're passing on so you can quicken the learning curve so that the next generation, the gap between first and second, is very small and then second and third it's going to be even smaller so yeah. it's going to grow the sport is that in your mind too i i already think that that what you're saying is really starting to happen with especially a lot of the different weight divisions like uh, if we look at adcc weight divisions i would say that that's the case at 66 77 and 88 kilos i would say that that's the case where we're talking about you know eyelashes between the highest level people if we were to put this in a computer simulation we might have a you know eight people being inter interchanged in the top three out of yep. ten times you know so uh the big thing and the thing that i think is so cool and what it does motivate me and when i sit back and think about this this is really nice because i didn't have this to look up to when i was coming up in the sport mm -hmm. you know i didn't see myself being like this if i had a, a dream of 
having a walkout to a match or I had a dream of having um, um, something huge. I had to pretend in my mind like I was a boxer. I was in the WWE or I yeah. was in you know the UFC. But now I get to have something very similar to this with jujitsu, with the sport that I actually you know want to do, that I have passion about with ADCC and these other events. Um, I think that if I do my part and uh, this next crew of guys that are coming up do our part, we're really going to make life easier for the next crew of guys coming up, you know, and whether I produce them or uh, they're produced somewhere else, I'll kind of be like that first, that original one, mm -hmm. that original class that, that made life easier for them. You know, they didn't have to struggle like the way I did where you weren't getting paid and you were scraping by and you had to do these things, you know, back in the day, if you did jujitsu and you were really successful and you didn't go into MMA, you better hope that you know how to run a gym or know how to run a business. You know, there's a lot of avenues now to make money. And the longer that we do this and the more that it takes off, this next crew of guys is going to have it a lot easier. And that makes me feel good. Do you ever look at the potential unknowings as a fan of your sport that some of the best jujitsu competitors had to go into MMA? And now that there's such a base for jujitsu, yeah. that's very hard for them uh, if they even could try to come back. Like someone like a, a Jacare or someone yeah. like that. Like, do you mm -hmm. ever look and go, I wish that they were here now. Mm -hmm. I, I mean, I think it's, uh, in a way, it was a little bit tragic. You know, a lot of those guys we lost, uh, it was like those years when, when Ali was uh, banned and we, a lot of people want to argue that we lost like the prime years of Muhammad Ali and we lost the prime years of John Jones and things like that. I feel like there's a lot of jujitsu athletes that we lost the, the prime of their careers, the prime of their lives because uh, they were forced to do it. You know, yeah. they weren't. Having a, a gym in, in a lot of the areas in Brazil, if you had 200 students, wouldn't really equal a whole lot. You know, you're talking about membership fees that would equal, you know, $20. It's not going to pay pay the bills. It's barely going to keep your lights on. So, yeah, they did have to move on. And they had the like Jacare and Damian Maya. They had very successful careers in the UFC, but they were masters of jujitsu. You know, mm -hmm. they were jujitsu masters. So it would have been nice to see them compete into you know mid to late 30s even 40 years old uh, a lot of the things a lot of times we always heard uh, jujitsu is a young man's sport it's not a, a sport for somebody who gets older but I really don't think it's true I just think they never had the chance to actually stay in the sport to realize their potential or to stay in the sport and, and do it for 20 years you know it's easy to be broke when you're in your mid 20s it's mm -hmm. not very easy to be broke when you're in your mid to late 30s you know so nowadays i think p we have a chance to do that and as uh training evolves too mm -hmm. at, at the start of anything new inadequate training you don't know what you're doing trial yeah. and error your lifespan is shortened within your sport yeah and if you look at fighters now you have mma fighters into their late 30s and 40s getting better yeah, which, which if you had said that five years ago, you would impossible because yeah. Randy Couture was like, this guy's defying gravity. You're like, mm -hmm. well, maybe he was ahead of the curve. Yeah. And now training is just getting more dialed in. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. And it's training as often as necessary, not as often as possible. Kind of what you alluded to, to where yeah. you don't have to do max effort day in, day out. I mean, my training in the beginning, if I, if I could like, I don't know if I can like accurately say how it was or like what I would do, but it was so ridiculously dumb knowing what I know now. It's almost, it baffles me that I actually did something like that. You know, it was actually it was so, so silly to do. We literally come in the gym and we would do a couple rounds of drills back and forth and somebody would stand up and be like, ah, fuck it, let's just train. And <laughs> that was it, it was zero to a hundred right from the get, you know, for an hour straight of sparring, it's ridiculous. And then to think that people did that in MMA with sparring, punches and kicks to yeah. the head with, you know, no headgear. And the stories you hear about a lot of these old school MMA gyms, you're like, how are these people not even fighting till they're 30? How are they alive till they're 30? Like, yeah. These guys are getting in car accidents every week in the gym. It doesn't even make sense, you know, like. For us, it's cool. Now we can look, at, I feel like planes, trains, and automobiles, we can, we can laugh now because we're okay. But at the yeah. time when we did it, it was, it was ridiculous and we didn't know any better. And it's part of the journey, right? Yeah. Of getting, sure. going through the course you're at, but now you've got students who are like, hey, you can avoid all this dumb stuff that we did. Yeah. But someone has to do the dumb stuff. 
right? Like yeah, that's the absolutely that's the trailblazing aspect absolutely, of it. Absolutely, yeah. Um, did you find coming from a small town was more of an asset than a liability? Mm, so um, it always has its challenges. I always hear people talk about where they grew up and the challenges that it had. You know, I never struggled for a meal. I never um, had to worry about about a roof being over my head. I had great parents, I had great support. I had a lot of great things, but living in a rural area, a small town does have its challenges. Everything's far away. Everything's a, a hike. You know, if yeah. you want to get into town to watch a movie, it's a 30 minute drive each way. If you wanted to get into town and start training, it was a 30 minute drive. You wanted to start crossing the border was only 10 minutes more driving to get to a gym that I used to train at in Detroit than it was to train at the first gym I started at in Canada. Yeah. Because you literally just cross the border, you're right there. So that wasn't too much of a transition for me. But yeah, it had a lot of its its struggles. And, you know, when you're growing up, nobody knew what jujitsu was. Literally everybody, you know, did the karate chop motion <laughs> to you or asked you if you did karate or that, you know, their brother or cousin did taekwondo and he's already a black belt and he's 14. So yeah. You must suck because you're a yellow belt. You know what I mean? <laughs> Things like this. So nobody really knew about it either. And, you know, the smaller, I think, like a small town where you grow up, people aren't as um, educated on a lot of those things coming out. You know what I mean? Now, nowadays, I think it might be a little different, but still you might not have that social acceptance that you would in a, a bigger, more affluent city. So, yeah, it definitely had its struggles, but I like it. I like growing up in the country. Mm -hmm. I do like I do miss. uh where I grew up, I, for a while, I didn't want to be in the country. I didn't want to be anywhere near that. And for now, I think it makes more sense to be in a suburban area because, you know, I have to get to the gym. I have to be close to my business, but one day I want to try and, uh, kind of replicate the, the property, the life I had back in the day. You have a very unique scenario in how you are coached, mm -hmm. not how you coach in that you don't have anyone hands-on all the time yeah you have i'd imagine do you have people that you chat with you bounce stuff off you, do you have any mentors that you travel to see to yeah. learn from yeah so uh i'm i'm basically like if you were to say i'm i'm kind of like uh i wouldn't say a ronin because i belong to a team but mm -hmm. i'm kind of like a traveling uh a traveling string man, a traveling uh, samurai kind of thing. You know what I mean? I have to bounce around and go to uh, different gyms with people who I've uh, met over the years and respect and, and uh, respect their ideas, respect their opinions. And uh, a lot of my learning is done through kind of a conversation just like this with somebody about jujitsu, you know, whether we sit on the mat and we bounce ideas off each other. We just have little talks, you know, in between training sessions, after training sessions. That's how a lot a lot of my learning comes about and uh, the more educated I get, the more I can learn on my own, you know, and I have a good crew of guys back in Toledo that I can bounce ideas off of. I have a great team and Keith Pedigo is a coach in um, Mount Vernon, Illinois. But yeah, I don't have anybody who's hands on watching me train, telling me like, hey, this is what you should do. You shouldn't do this. You shouldn't do that. So I've had a, I've had a career of trial by fire, to be mm -hmm. honest, you know what I mean? So yeah while it has its challenges and while it's has its struggles i think it's uh it's paid off well and uh i've really learned how to be a good student you know i really, really learned how to be you. a good student yeah I had, you have no choice if you're not going to be a good student in in uh my situation you're going to fall behind a lot quicker than everybody else you know it's it's really hard to fall behind when you have a good coach that's hands-on with you six or seven days a week because you just have to be a robot you mm -hmm. just have to do what they say. I have to do a lot more work than those people. I have to do my own studying, program my own training, um, talk to different people, make, you know, trips and these little, you know, even a weekend where I'm like, Hey, this guy's in town. I got to go see him, you know? Yeah. And it's not a weekend vacation. It's like a, it's mentally and it's physically taxing to, to learn and, and get ahead of the curve on these people. So yeah, it does it definitely does have the challenges, but it's made me a great student of the game. When I first got introduced to you and we talked, we got introduced through Burley Hawk. Shout mm -hmm. out to Burley. Um, it seems like you're a student of more than just jujitsu. Like you're a student of strength, yeah. which was like phenomenally interesting, right? Not yeah. many athletes come in here who have a deep understanding and interest and love for all things strength. Mm -hmm. Where did that come from? 
So I, I would say that I was interested in bodybuilding before martial arts and jiu-jitsu, honestly. Um, my dad introduced me to martial arts. My dad introduced me to martial arts long before um, I did jiu-jitsu, but he never put me into any kind of like structured training program yeah. or any kind of gym. Um, it, we've talked about it before. I don't know if it's that he, he believed that um, 11 or 12 years old would be the right age. I don't know if he thought I wasn't ready, which I'm kind of thankful he did because, you know, looking back at me at eight, nine, 10, I don't think I would have stuck with it or had the same uh, love for it as I did, but always love bodybuilding. You mm -hmm. know, I always loved the uh, being in uh, my grandma's basement and seeing going through the old muscle mags and going through the old um, uh, bodybuilding um, magazines and seeing all the old school guys, especially like the eighties, you know, and that was kind of like the, beginning of you know the golden era was the 70s but the 80s had the first kind of guys that were like really really big and yeah. jacked you know what i mean like you know lee haney lee labrada guys like this so um so much when you're a kid you get a little bit captivated by it but i've always been kind of dorky kind of nerdy you know and i think i got that from my dad we really like to study we really like to educate ourselves on the different things and um it was always something that i could study that wouldn't be like if you study too much jujitsu or you just study too much technique and fighting sometimes you just start to you know overcoat the mind and yep. you start to go nowhere but it gave me a something that really interest interested me fascinated me that i could study that would just you know help my mind keep going rather than just like compile it with too much information so it was always a very interesting thing that i could uh take in interested me and then it, it ended up helping me out because i ended up studying you know, training methodology and things like this. Do you think that gave you a huge head start over many? Because professional doesn't mean professional. Yeah, no. Um, especially in new up and coming sports, mm -hmm. like um, being a black belt doesn't mean shit. Yeah. So it's like all these things are just yeah. terms. So you having an interest, a deep interest and in a student of strength in your quest to becoming a professional grappler were you able to get that structure ahead of most i i, I think i'm the pioneer of strength training in jiu-jitsu i really do i'm i'm the first guy maybe there's somebody else who did it but the, they're not as successful as i am or as good as me in competition i'm the first guy who is truly a world-class competitor truly one of the best in the world best of his generation to um be as educated and as as um successful with strength training as i am i believe that 100 percent. and uh did it give me a huge leg up on the game yeah i i really do think it did because uh it it made me i was confident enough in what i knew i was confident enough in what i had studied what i to myself what i had learned with all the people that i talked to and all the people that um i got to meet in the strength uh industry that uh I knew I, I was right. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? I was confident that I was right. You know, you never know 100%, but I was confident that I was right. So a lot of times when these people told me that I needed to do Hindu push-ups instead of um, a front squat, I could be like, bullshit. Yeah. You know, when somebody said, I need to do uh, yoga four times a week and only lift once a week, I was like, you're a liar. You know what I mean? I, I was confident enough in what I knew. And now you start to see... It, you know, a lot of people in the, in my sport start to kind of veer towards what I'm kind of doing, what mm -hmm. I'm kind of trying to say, you know? So yeah, it definitely, it definitely, um, gave me a leg up on the competition, but I think, uh, I wouldn't have had the leg up on the comp competition if I didn't have the confidence in it from as much as I'd studied. Where did you start seeing the benefits of weight training or strength, like accurate strength training within jujitsu? So I started um, getting back, like I said, I started really young, kind of got shown the ropes, worked out a summer, kept me active. I was, I was not playing hockey over the summer, so it gave me something to do where I wasn't just, you know, farting around or sitting at home, which was always like, my parents were really big on that. You couldn't, there was no way you were allowed to sit at home and do fuck all. You always had to be out doing something. Mm -hmm. Even though I lived on a farm and you could never just sit around <laughs> there, you had to like go do something and hanging out with your friends or riding your bike. That didn't count. You had to, you had to do something. So that was great. Um, 
once I got back into lifting, I would say it'd be like 14, 15 different kind of workouts just to um, be in shape, whether it was to gain a little weight, cut a little weight, things like that for competition. And that happened for a little while. But then when I was 19 or 20 years old, uh, I had a shoulder injury and I trained with a lot of really big people. Like I was the smallest guy in my training group by like 40 pounds. So I needed a way to get stronger. Mm -hmm. I couldn't gain that much weight because I, I'm short. You know, I can't be like 5'7", five, 5'8", five, and 210 pounds it literally doesn't make sense. So I had to find something that got me like strong and not huge. The problem with that is when you're lifting in these kind of like, you know, these German volume training, for example, 10 sets of 10 to get really strong, five by fives. You get really strong, it does work, but you get really, really, really sore and you get really broken down. And mm -hmm. it was really hard for me to do that and keep up with my training. Mm -hmm. Probably because we just literally fist fought in the gym all the time, you know, when we were training or we were yeah. rolling in jujitsu, but it was really hard to do that. So that's when I had to call on a lot of the things that I read and a lot of things that I studied before. And that's when I really started to look into the conjugate method. That's when I really started to look at what, what was going on here at Westside. And I found something where I can kind of satisfy myself all around. I can be in the gym four days a week, which I loved. Mm -hmm. I could do some heavy lifting, which I loved, but it was beneficial to what I wanted to do. I wanted to get stronger, but not gain 20 mm -hmm. pounds of muscle. And I could adjust the workout how I needed. I could pull back on the volume on my accessory work. I could pull back on the volume of my dynamic work. And uh, I ended up making a lot of strength gains. I ended up becoming healthier. I ended up saving my shoulder because, you know, I built up enough tissue and enough muscle around it to uh, keep it as stable as I could. So any of the big guys couldn't rip my arm apart. And uh, it was a success. It was the first kind of program that I used that was successful. How did it transfer directly into your sport? So I'm not saying like directly into technique, but where does strength training become an aid? The biggest, the biggest thing that I always tell people about uh, strength training that I've found is um, injury prevention. You know, I just think when you, when you strength train properly and uh, again, you need rest and recovery mm -hmm. and you need all these other things. But when you, when you strength train properly, um, you're harder to kill straight up. You're just harder to kill. You're harder to injure. You're harder to hurt. You become stronger, your tendons, your muscles, your joints, they all become stronger and more adaptable uh, to what you do. So I never really brought my sport in the weight room. I didn't hang my gi up over a chin up bar and, you know, do like weird grip exercises. I didn't do uh, hip escapes up and down the gym floor or anything like that. I did exercises that made specific areas of my body stronger and targeted the specific areas of my body. And then when I used the technique that I'd learned over the 10 or 12 years of, at the time that I was training, um, it worked a lot better because mm -hmm. I was stronger and I was more able-bodied. So um, the more that I have trained, the more effective that I get because I get better when I'm doing jujitsu and I'm, I'm, my mind is on jujitsu to study and to learn and to train. Um, I'm getting more technical. I'm learning new techniques. I'm doing all these things. But when I'm in the gym and I'm studying strength training, I'm becoming stronger and better, more able-bodied so that uh, the car just drives faster. It drives smoother with the techniques that I've learned in jujitsu. So that was the biggest thing. And I, I'm thankful I did this. I'm thankful my studies led me this way that I didn't do any of these weird um super specific mm -hmm. you know what i mean everything needs to be specific but we over specify things in sport i think you know we don't need to bring a basketball in the gym mm -hmm. and different things like that so that's what i think really helped me out was i kept them very separate I, even though they are you know they're one it is training but i kept them separate and together they really help each other that would have been considered backwards a long time ago. taboo no yeah. completely taboo like if a jiu-jitsu guy heard me say this he would think that i had my head so far up my ass i couldn't see daylight you know so <laughs> yeah. that was always the thing is like I, I had to be like really sure and i was really confident in that mm -hmm. at a time 
when I was thought to be out of my mind. Like even the people close to me were kind of like, what are you doing, bro? You know what I mean? Yeah. Like, I'm like, we got to get a platform. You know, we let's use this, you know, I used to squat with like this half rack. Like if you, if you, if you failed while squatting, you probably would just die. <laughs> like, honestly, like, you know what I mean? Box squats and heavy squats on this thing. You had to walk it out like a, a half a mile and squat and then walk it back in, you know? So uh, people would be like, what are you doing, man? Like, this isn't what you do. This isn't how you train. A lot of people from Brazil who I was training with at the time, that was completely ludicrous to them, yeah. you know? But yeah, now I, I don't, on this podcast, I'm going to sound like somebody who's pretty smart. When people in jujitsu come onto this, they're going to say like, oh yeah, you know, that makes sense. And that's what I want. You yeah. know, I want people to not, I don't want anybody to have to go through all these different training methods and things. I want people to, just like what I said, this next generation that's coming up, I want them to be able to hear this and see this and be able to say like, man, I'm going to do what he does and I'm going to listen to him because he's good. You know, he yeah. wins world titles. He has world titles. He's one of the best in the world. Um, if I was up here saying all these crazy ideas that I have, but have nothing to back it up. I didn't have anything to back it up, nobody would care. Everybody could just tell me I was crazy. You know what I mean? But now they have to respect it. They have to say it works. Well, the term training general, to be specific, was blasphemy. You're like, well, we've, and I've seen it as a coach. You've had athletes come in who are so afraid they're going to lose the technique that they've spent years. Mm -hmm. And in a couple of weeks, you're going to lose it. Yeah. Like you're not going to lose the ability to throw a jab because you strength train generally. And it's just a, a, the true goal of strength conditioning, as you know, is to maximize skill acquisition mm -hmm. for sports. 100%. People get mixed up in powerlifting. Like the power lifts are the skill that they're requiring. And I think that gets overlapped sometimes. Yeah. But when you work with athletes, where strength conditioning is a cog, it's an important cog of a bigger machine. Yeah. With the end goal is like, how can I give you the most opportunity to either improve, maintain skill? Because skill will always be an advantage. And if you have the endurance to keep a high level of skill over a period of time, well, then you're going to dominate. Yeah. I'd imagine as a pro athlete, not just a pro athlete, as a world champion, you just don't want to go out there and put like you want to dominate. Because Absolutely. that's what champions Absolutely. do. You want to be the best Dante of all time. Yes. 100%. Um, 100%. If someone is starting out in jujitsu, mm -hmm. is it an advantage to be more athletic than someone who is not? Or like, let me try to rephrase this. I have such a fundamental understanding of skill, enough to be a very competent coach during the conditioning. But in terms of the practitioner, if I have one year of skill, but a high level of athleticism, is that more beneficial or to my aid to someone who has two or three years of skill, but no athletic background. So this is, this is a question again, where we would always hear in jujitsu when, uh, you know, size doesn't matter and strength doesn't matter, you know, things like this. That was the old, uh, uh preach about jujitsu and hoist Gracie being this 170 or 180 pound guy and submitting everybody in the UFC. Okay. Well, nowadays, everybody has some knowledge, you know what I mean? So now that everybody has knowledge and if we have knowledge, athleticism and strength and conditioning come into play huge. Yep. Skill is always going to be number one. You know, um, you're not going to beat somebody who is 10 times as skilled as you, regardless of your strength, regardless of how athletic you are. But when you're a very good athlete and you're a very gifted athlete, one year of solid training and solid technical advancement goes a really long way for you compared to somebody who's not very athletically gifted or not very strong mm -hmm. or not very coordinated. So it's, it's a huge benefit to be athletic. That's what a lot of people will always take away. Um, but when we say about somebody who's not very athletic, that has three years of skill development, um, is three years enough time to beat somebody who's 10 times as athletic as you with one year of skill development? A lot of times, no. Mm -hmm. A lot of times, no, it's not. Because three years is not the amount of time it takes a master. You probably can't master any aspect of jiu-jitsu. You couldn't mm -hmm. be a guard master. You couldn't be a takedown master. You couldn't be a, 
um, joint lock submission master, a strangle submission master. You couldn't. You couldn't in three years. Not going to happen. So, yeah, that dude who's a lot more athletic than you with one year of training, consistent training, consistent skill development, is probably still going to beat your ass. Yeah. People in jiu-jitsu don't want to face that. People in jiu-jitsu don't want to admit that. You know what I mean? And that's why uh, athletics and strength is a hard thing to overcome. It goes both ways, too. Like, where you have, we all know people who are incredibly strong. Yeah. But will sit on a couch and go, there's not a hope. Like, I'm going to kick that guy's ass, or mm -hmm. I can definitely choke him out. Yeah. And then they get on with a competent person who's maybe yeah. half their weight, and you're like, this is a whole different yeah. ball game. They have the confidence of, like, you know, going to a jiu-jitsu gym when they used to be a... Uh, uh, mid-level college wrestler and you know they played football in high school and they work out now and now they just like go out on friday nights and try and score girls they don't really work out or train anymore but they still have that athleticism they're still powerful mm -hmm. people yeah they're gonna go to a jujitsu gym and smoke these people who are hobbyists who have been doing it for two or three years yeah they're gonna give those people trouble or they're gonna beat them up they're not beating me up they're not yeah. beating any of the people in my competition room. They're not beating 10 to 15 people that I have on the mat each night on a Tuesday, Thursday for my no-gi class. They're going to get stomped. You know what I mean? So there comes a, a, a time, there comes a point, just like you said, where um, it, it's not effective anymore. You can't rely on your strength and your athleticism and your skill and uh sk or not your skill necessarily but your strength and your athleticism but skill is always going to be number one mm -hmm. you know you're always going to want to develop skill and that was the really cool thing when we train here you know when i started training um at west side is you told me something like that you're like listen we're not here to make you this or make you that we're here to give you basically you know more tools so you can become a more skilled athlete and i was like fuck that's that's it. Like this guy just answered what I would want to have out of a, out of a, a trainer. You know what I mean? That's what I want to have. I want to be able to use this to be better at what I do. Mm -hmm. I don't need you to know anything about what I do. You, you know, I can, I can tell you what you need to know, or I can answer your questions and tell me what I need to know and answer my questions. But you're giving me the tools it takes to get my body ready to be the best I can be in my sport, you know? And that's, that was a special thing. If we dig deep or deeper into that comment, just so people can really understand this from an athlete's point of view, because I can keep saying this day in, day out, but like, what does that mean? I can explain what it means from a strength coach's perspective, mm -hmm. because I think strength conditioning is moving on from I'm making you bigger, faster, and stronger. Yeah. And we're utilizing strength science to help guide us more rather than like leaning into it too much. But with the training, that you have done and are doing, how is that giving you the opportunity to develop skill? So with the strength training that I've been doing, especially in our, I would say, six to eight months together that we've done consistent work, um, I'm not only just, you know, the bigger, stronger, faster thing, I don't think that that is a good uh, thing to apply across the board. Mm -hmm. I think the biggest thing that I've that I've gotten is I've unlocked so much more from my body than I really thought I had before. And it goes deep. It goes to joint flexibility. It goes to strength in different positions that I never knew I needed. Muscle endurance is through the roof for me, like something I never had before. And I never would have realized this and I never would have realized what I was lacking unless I came here and trained with you. Do you know what I mean? And uh, when my muscle endurance has gotten better and my uh, joint strength and joint flexibility and my isometric strength and those things increase, which were a lot of the things that were really um, lacking, my game changed completely, you know, especially a, as a competition base because now my pace can be way higher than it was before. Um, am I applying any different techniques than I was before? Not really. You know, I'm always making little technical adjustments, but really not really. Um, I'm just a better version of myself. I'm a better body. I'm a better athlete. I'm a better person. 
so I can apply my techniques a lot better and I can apply my techniques for a lot longer in a match. You know, when my matches are 10, 15 and 20 minutes, um, that's great with me. You know, my pacing is, is superb at this point. And I'm able to apply pressure and technique and attack my opponents a lot more than I was in the past. Whereas in the past, you have five, six minutes of a lot of pressure on somebody and then four minutes of like, we need this fucking match to be over. I'm yeah. dying. You know what I yeah. mean? So I don't have that anymore. And that, that if, if any athlete is watching this and hears me say that, they will know about how key that is. Because that, that's what wins and loses the biggest matches in the world. That's what wins and loses world championships and Olympic gold medals is that. So yeah, that's there's just a huge, huge, huge growth in all those those areas. You said a few things to me in the gym that have stood out, and one was just from this morning, and that it's an illusion that you think someone's going all out all the time. They might give the appearance of it, but they're like you're not you're yeah. dictating your pace. What level or how long were you in the game before you you understood that? It, honestly, it took me, a, I would say, up until the last three years, to be honest, two to three years that I realized that. always thought that it, your conditioning was about how hard you could push, like at 100 RPMs for however many minutes or as close to that for however many minutes. And it took me a really long time. And it really, like, it really, like, solidified with me when I started to come here and work uh, more directly with you, that that's not really the case. The case is being able to keep a pace, ascend it to a peak to where you can, if I'm looking at it for jujitsu terms, ascend to a peak where you can break your opponent and either continue to ascend until the rest of the match or keep that level where it will eventually break them or you will eventually break past their guard or break past their defense to eventually submit them and win the match. So that's what it's about. That's what pacing's about when we talk about combat. Mm -hmm. It's not about, I'm going to come out off the rip, slam you on the floor, go buck wild, and all these things, and then eventually submit you. If I don't submit you, though, I'm going to get really, really tired. You yeah. know? And there's a lot of exercises, and not to get like too specific, that we do here, where I could come out and rip these first 10 reps fucking hard, and the next 20, it's going to take me like, three minutes to do the next 20 yeah. whereas if we control and we do things right and we use the training to work that muscle even if it is really struggling in three six nine weeks whatever it is we can complete those 30 reps in under a minute rather than have 10 really hard really good reps 20 shit ones that took me three minutes to do mm -hmm. you know so that's a big thing whenever we're working with the wheelbarrow or sleds or anything's like that that's what it's about it's about that constant pace that builds to a peak where you can maintain that and you can keep it going if you apply that to jujitsu it's keeping that pace that you build to a peak where it's going to break your opponent and he's going to have no no reason to or no ability to defend against you if you come out going crazy against somebody who's really technical you're going to be able to defend against your attacks, especially when they're fresh. Mm -hmm. You know, so when two people are fresh, your defense is going to be at 100%. My offense is going to be at 100%. If I drain my offense to 50% and you keep your defense at 80, now we have a problem. You know, now yeah. I'm like way outgun. You're outgun or you're outgunning me big time. Whereas if I can keep my um, offense only going from 100 to 85 in 10 minutes, I can keep attacking you and break your defense down to 20%. Now you're fucked. You can't stop me. So, yeah, pacing, control, building to a peak, building to uh, a peak pace is, is essential in combat. Taking everything that you've learned and learning as a student, as an athlete, as a competitor, you bring it back to your gym as a coach. Do you pass on any of this information well firstly is your gym split into recreational and competitors yes does anyone from recreational graduate to competitors there's yeah there are quite a few um i would say that as far as just the straight recreational students so the comp team is made up mostly of people who have seeked it out so athletes or practitioners who um 
have seeked it out because they want to make a run at the at jujitsu. They want to have it as a career, whether they want to do it at my level or they want to do it at some kind of level to have it be something that can support their life as a, as a form of livelihood. Mm -hmm. uh, those are what the competition class is for. So there are a few students who have come as recreational or hobbyists or people who just practice to go into the competition class. I do have a few. And these are the people who I really share a lot of these things with. The people recreationally, I can share some of it, but I can't share it the way I want to share it or the way that I think I should yep. share it because I just can't tell people, you know, the way I want to tell people shit. Like, you know, that's that's not good. This is this is how we have to look at it or uh, this shit's going to be really fucking hard and, yeah. you know, it's going to suck, but, you know, tough shit. Whereas the people who have chose to come to the competition class, I don't really need to spare their feelings or I don't really need to worry about bursting their bubble. Whereas a lot of people, when I'm telling them these kind of things that we're talking about, I'm like going against everything that they've put their 30, 40, 50 years into. It's kind of hard for me to come in when they're paying me a membership and just burst their bubble and be like, yeah, you know that? That's fucking bullshit. Yeah. You know what I mean? Uh, at the end of the day with my students, I'm there to teach them jujitsu and I'm there yeah. to offer them... Um, a clean, friendly, safe training environment. And that's what I do. I, I believe I do a great job of that with them. Um, if they ever have questions or they ever want to move past and get to that next level, yeah, then uh, the talks are going to be a little bit different because now it's it's getting a little more real. Enter at you your know? own risk. Exactly. So so with uh, I love the competition training because I don't need to watch what I say. You know, I have my belief. And like I said, I know my way works. Mm -hmm. I have my, my proof. I don't need... Uh, I don't need anybody to like argue with me about it. If they don't agree with it, that's fine. You don't need to agree with it, but I won two world titles this way, you know, yeah. doing this and, and I'm, I'm continuously improving. I'm, I'm the best I've been now for a lot of reasons and in a lot of ways than I've been in my entire life. So you can not agree with it, but this is how we do it and this works. So I know, and I believe, and I've seen firsthand if, the competitors and the people who are serious do things this way, uh, they will be successful and they will have success. Do you have any issues changing hats from coach to competitor? I believe it is a, it is a struggle. Um, it is quite a bit of a struggle between worrying about where you're at as a individual, as an athlete, with competitions coming up, with different things like that. And then at the same time, worrying about others and where they're going and what they're doing. Uh, but in a way, I've almost created an environment where they have strong individuality as well as me. So a lot of times we run the training session and we do all the, you know, the same things in training, but uh, they're not completely dependent on somebody guiding them by the hand yeah. the same way I was uh, because I can kind of coach them or I can kind of show them the way not to be. And I think that's really good. And I think that saves us a lot of time where, you know, I don't need to be there because there's a lot of athletes and there's a lot of, uh, you know, I'm in the combat world more than, than around any other type of athlete. So I will say this, there's a lot of combat athletes that need to be led by the hand. Mm -hmm. Um, they need to be taken to a gym. They need to be like forced to train kind of thing and, and stuff like that. The The people that I have in my gym, I, I don't attract those kind of people because that's not, you know, the kind of athlete that I am and that's not the kind of coach that I am. So I don't attract anybody that I have to pick up and drive to the gym five days a week. I pick up people who have uh, a lot of confidence and that are yeah. strong individuals. So yeah, I think in a way it is a little bit difficult, but I think I've kind of shown the way to them to make the most of that situation to be strong individuals that can transition between being a good coach and uh focused and uh driven athlete what is the path for a professional submission grappler what is that like now what is i, I don't want you obviously to divulge any personal information but in terms of I'd imagine at the start, there is a hell of a lot of sacrifices. Mm -hmm. um, but is it like 
MMA in that you can turn up the competitions, you can start making a living. What is that pathway like for someone who is starting now to become a professional grappler? Is this something from today and in seven years they can make a full-time job out of it? Or is it still in that pasty region of figuring out? It's tough to say how long it'll take you to make it. And it's tough to say if you'll ever make it because it is such a, there's not very many of us still, you know, still to this day, there's not that many. Um, it, it would be hard to fill all the spots around this table with all the people that I consider true professional grapplers at the highest level uh, that make, you know, real money and that can say, yeah, I'm a professional grappler. This is, you know, all I do. There's very, very few. So it is tough to say um, if you'll you'll make it. It's not necessarily like a, you know, basketball, football type mm -hmm. uh, talk, right? So it is something that is difficult. But if you want to make it, you're you're really gonna have to to start to get comfortable and swallow the idea that you are not gonna be recognized and you are not going to be um, rewarded for very much. You know what I mean? Um, winning a brown belt world title, so jujitsu is blue, purple, brown, and then black belt. I mean, winning brown belt world titles and brown belt pans championships and world pros and all the biggest tournaments, I got promoted to black belt and I bawled my eyes out because I realized that shit literally didn't matter. You know what I mean? That shit literally meant nothing. I spent all that money and all that time and all that kind of shit, and it means nothing. Nobody cares anymore. But at the same time, it didn't mean nothing because I wouldn't be at the level that I was at going into the black belt, going into the professional ranks mm -hmm. if I didn't cut my teeth at the lower ranks, right? But it's hard to swallow. Whereas when you go to uh, professional baseball, professional football, you know, they always say like, oh, you know, college doesn't matter. College doesn't matter. But yeah, it matters. It got you a huge contract, mm -hmm. you know, paid for, you know, a house for your family. It pays for every, you're set for the rest of your life. Basically, if you busted your ass in college, you have an education paid for all these types of things. That's not like that in jujitsu. There's zero dollars. There's zero recognition. There's maybe a, a few cool sponsors, but now it's basically like wipe the slate clean and go on from there. Um, nowadays, a little bit different because you don't need to be a black belt to be a professional grappler. There's purples and brown belts who are really successful and do beat a lot of the black belts, right? So um, if you want to do this, there's going to be a, a good bit of time where you're not being recognized, you're not being seen. Um, so my biggest advice to the people that, that are coming up is I wouldn't worry about any of uh, media coverage, anything like this. You have to get as much experience and as much time on the mat as you can and, and competition. That's, that's just it. You have to travel. You got to get in your car and you got to find where a tournament is. You got to find where a money bracket is. You know, if there's $500, if it's 250, if it's a thousand, 2000, whatever it is, get in your car, drive down there and fucking compete. If you got a girlfriend who's down, who's down for it, you and your girl get in the car and you go down there. You and your boy who you train with get down there and you do as many as you can. You do one every weekend if you can do that. Because starting out when I was a black belt in 2017 and 2018, I did almost 30 competitions a year in those two years. So that's an insane amount. That's uh, two to three competitions each month. Some months it would be like three, <laughs> four, five weekends, just like back to back competing and you know, I didn't want to lose time training, so I would train Monday to Friday. I would get in my car Saturday morning, drive down, drive home, drive back to visit my family, come back and do the next week and do the same thing the next weekend, the same thing the next weekend, then maybe take a weekend off. So it's really busting your ass, and there's not going to be a lot of eyes on you. But eventually, that's the kind of thing that pays off. If you were going to give your definition of a pro athlete, mm -hmm. what is that? Well, professional athlete... Uh, just in general, if you wanted to shorten it up, a professional athlete is somebody who makes a living off of what they do and somebody who gets paid. Uh, being a professional is when you have a deeper definition. So there's a lot of people who get paid for what they do, but I don't feel like they're professionals. I don't feel that they commit to their craft. I don't feel that they've mastered their craft. I don't feel that they work the way that they should. Um, when you're a professional, when you're a true professional, nothing else 
nothing else can go towards anything but what you're doing. Every single thing in your life, your relationships, your nutrition, your sleep, your your home, every single thing you can think of has to go towards being the best at what you do. You know, that's what being a professional is. A professional is committed and professional in his approach through every aspect of his life. You know, he doesn't he doesn't shit on his diet, he doesn't shit on his relationships, he doesn't shit on the people around him, he doesn't half ass in the gym, he doesn't take time away from it, and it's a 24 seven, three, six, five job for as long as that you say you're active. If you retire, then you're done until then it's 365 days a year, you know? So that's what I think being a professional is, is full commitment and not just full commitment to these six hours a day that you're training. And then you <laughs> fuck off for the rest of the day is six hours a day that you're training or four or three or whatever it is. But the rest of the day is around that. The rest of the day is for that because tomorrow you're going to do it again and the next day and the next day and the next day. And uh, that's a really hard thing. You know, there's a lot of people who are professional athletes that don't, um, that aren't true professionals. So, yeah. It's as if you, uh, you structure your life in to your sport. Yeah. Yeah. I, I have no choice. You know, I can't go anywhere. I can't not. Dude, well, but you purposely put yourself yeah, in that choice, that's right? Yeah, it's you exactly can't. Um, I wanted it. It's not as if you can just go up and leave when you mm -hmm. have two gyms. Mm -hmm. So you have two sets of people. You have your recreational. You have your competition team. Yep. Then, to the position you're in to study, you have no choice but to study deep and hard. And I'd imagine you review a hell of an amount of tape. Yeah, yeah, crazy amount, crazy amount of uh, matches and things like that. Not just instructionals are a really big thing nowadays. I think instructional DVDs are more popular now than when I was coming up. But uh, the amount of matches that I've watched and the amount of fights and things like that, like I know I know every result of every tournament and every win and loss that everybody has. I know if, if you're, like, you're like somebody in the sport, I know who you lost to. I know who you, you mm -hmm. know, beat. I know how you won. I know how you lost, kind of things like that. So... Yeah, I watch jujitsu like crazy. I watch matches like crazy. Boxing, MMA, wrestling, jujitsu, all of it, all forms of combat I really, really dive into. Do you find researching, learning, and practicing other disciplines help you be a better practitioner? For sure, for sure. Honestly, I think anything that is, if you're ingesting good information, the same way you're ingesting good nutrition, it's beneficial, you know, so... Um, I think I'm lucky and I'm fortunate that the information that I like to study, the information that I like to ingest is around combat, mm -hmm. whether it's other combat sports, mm -hmm. strength training, different things like that. Um, bodybuilding, I don't think is very applicable to any kind of uh, combat sport or any kind of sport. You know, bodybuilding, you're just like building mass and unusable tissue for something other than just posing so i don't think that's the most applicable but strength training and all that has come from and and uh was developed around bodybuilding so that's that's like part of it you know mm -hmm. so everything that i study and that's interesting to me is is kind of around combat sports and that's what i practice so i think i'm kind of fortunate in that aspect i don't like to uh I don't like to go out and like play poker or play blackjack or anything like that as much as I like to sit down and watch matches and study jujitsu. Do you have a system? Like, do you have a goal when you sit down and watch tape? Um, or is it that you're just observant of everything and you're looking for something that, that, that kind of peeps out? It could, it could kind of depend, you know, that, that changes often. If I'm looking, if I'm struggling in one specific area, mm -hmm. I know who or what I can watch to help that. Do you know what I yeah. mean? But I only know that because I've spent so much time just watching. And I think just watching is beneficial a lot of times rather yeah. than just waiting for that one moment that that you think will help you out. You know, I think it makes more sense to um, sometimes I'll have to watch a match like three or four or five times. Sometimes I'll have to watch all of somebody's content multiple times mm -hmm. or watch an instructional DVD all the way through and then pick through it again. So um, I'm only able to study things 
really specific because I've already seen that content. You yeah. know what I mean? So if it's my first time watching something, I'm just going to watch it. Then I might play it back and start to pick through it again, different things like that. So usually I'm watching something without too much in my mind, just kind of watching, seeing what I can pick up, seeing what I see. And then if there's something there that interests me or something that's, you know, makes a little bit of sense or like kind of triggers my my mind a little bit because I have seen it once or twice before, then I'll go back and I'll be more specific. To jump back onto bodybuilding, from my perspective, I think bodybuilding is a prime example of the pursuit of perfection of exercise execution. You can learn how, like there, what I've learned from talking with a bunch of bodybuilders, coaches, is that how they execute a movement is unbelievable. Like they mm. put so much emphasis because they have to build mass. Yeah. But what we can get from it is like, okay, if we have to target a muscle a little bit different, well, they're the masters of they're that. They're the masters. They really um, are. Like how to do lap pull down. Like as simple as a, like we've done thousands of lap pull downs, mm -hmm. but they actually start with the lats. Yeah. And you're like, well, what do you mean? Well, you don't use your arms to lap pull down. You're like, oh. Okay, there's little things that we can take. Completely different. It uh, just jumped in my head. And yeah. Kind of well, I think another thing about bodybuilding too that I tell people is like, I, I, you guys just don't understand the amount of, when you talk about, when I talked about what it is to be a professional, how everything in your life has to revolve around what you've basically chose to do with your life. Mm -hmm. um, in a way, when you decide to do something as your career, you kind of sell your soul to the devil kind of thing because everything you do is for that mm -hmm. in a way you do not so much but with bodybuilding they embody that i think more than anybody that i've seen because every single thing is to give the best package that they can on stage they don't miss a minute of sleep they won't miss a meal they won't miss a cup of water they won't miss a nap they won't miss a workout they won't skip a rep they won't skip nothing 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 not a single thing down to like the most minuscule thing that you can think mm -hmm. coffee beans from a specific place nuts from a specific place that haven't been touched by whatever all these things is just crazy 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 dedication and people can't really fathom that you know people can't really handle something like that bodybuilders are some of the most dedicated committed people that you can find 100 percent. yeah and they do all that knowing they'll go to a competition that there is really no objective measure. Craziest thing ever. You know that what I you mean? You can do everything right. Yeah. And yet it's the subjective um, judge that's going to go through. Um, from your experience, what are things that you look at, especially in our realm of strength conditioning, that people should avoid? because the snake oils men are coming in now because mm -hmm. jujitsu is becoming more and more popular. But what are things that you see to try avoid with strength conditioning programs for jujitsu? Uh, if, okay. So with strength and conditioning programs, what you should get away from is any of these, these programs or any of these movements that tell you what you shouldn't be doing if that kind of makes sense. Like when you have these programs that tell you you shouldn't deadlift because of how it can harm you and you shouldn't squat because of how it can harm you and they always have these alternatives to things, you know what mm -hmm. I mean? And they always want to like swap out these different things to do these different kind of exercise and different things like that. When Whenever you see a pro program that tells you that you shouldn't be doing something that's tried and true across every fucking sport and every strength sport and strength athlete uses you have to become a little wary of yeah. it because what makes our sport so much different than all these other sports how are we that much different physically than a wrestler than an mma fighter than a um any kind of combat athlete we're not that much different our mm -hmm. sport is a little different but our body shouldn't be that much different so why would we not use the exercises that they're using you know those are things that i think that you should really stay away from. I think that you should stay away from a lot of these uh, specific uh, programs that try and combine sport 
in the weight room that try and combine mobility over the top in the weight room that try and combine uh, recovery over the top in the weight room. That's not what this is for. We're mm -hmm. talking about, you know, strength training. What is strength training? It's not fucking stretching. It's not wearing your gi in the weight room. It's not all these crazy things. It should be completely separate. You know, if you want the best of, of each aspect, if you want the best of recovery, it needs to be its own thing. If you want the best of strength training, it needs to be its own thing. If you want the best of jujitsu training, it needs to be its own thing. Mm -hmm. So, if you're trying to combine all these things in one, you're really going to discount the the advantages of all of them and you're going to get a pretty poor package. So people who tell you that you should steer away from proven methods, stay away from that. And people who try and, you know, mumble jumble all these things together to make this say this, it stretches you and it recovers you and it, it's, it does, it helps you train jujitsu. Like, bro, I don't need you to train jujitsu you know what i'm saying yeah. like if that's what you you're trying to spin to me no way so those are the things i would say definitely avoid strength training to kind of wrap this up and i hope this is the the first of many conversations moving forward is from someone who has studied west side mm -hmm. done a conjugate like you've done your interpretation of the conjugate method to suit your sport which is what you're supposed to do to training in here is there any significant differences or something that you're like, oh, I didn't expect that compared to looking from the outside in, but been on the inside now? Is there anything that you see that is a lot different than what you thought? Being here. Yes. Um, so like with nutrition, I started working with a really good nutritionist that uh, I've been working with him for a little over a year now, a little over 12 months. And I always ate quite well. Mm -hmm. I always ate five or six meals a day. I always ate you know, proteins, fats, carbs, a little bit of veggies, but I didn't realize how I should be balancing my meals yeah. and how much of certain things I should be having. I wasn't eating enough carbs. I was eating enough protein. Sometimes I was eating a little too much protein. I definitely wasn't eating enough fruits and vegetables. I definitely wasn't getting the amount of greens I should get in. So yeah, there were some changes, but were they like huge, significant changes? Not really. I didn't realize any huge significant changes training here as far as a belt squat, a box squat, overhead press. Those mm -hmm. weren't foreign exercises to me. I have a lot of experience doing them. Uh, I had a good amount of strength. I was quite explosive. I had a good knowledge of all the machines that were here. The emphasis on muscle endurance was the biggest thing and was the hardest thing to get past. Um, not just using things that test your strength, using things that test your explosivity, but using things that are like, holy shit, I, I don't know if I can complete this many. You know what I mean? Yeah. The, 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 the pressure and the emphasis on muscle endurance and time under tension here is way more than I ever expected. And it was a really hard thing to mentally deal with because I'm like, man, I know I'm in good shape. I know I'm not weak. I know I'm pretty athletic. Yeah. I don't feel very strong and, and athletic right now. You know what I mean? But again, like this, this system and like Westside and uh, Lou has always said, it is about strengthening the weaknesses, you know? And uh, I would probably never have found those weaknesses as quickly as you guys found them. So being here, those weaknesses got sought out really, really quick, probably within the first two to three sessions you guys had a good idea of where you needed to attack and target. And uh, since then, my training has skyrocketed like it did six years ago when I first started using the conjugate method. So, yeah, I'd say that was it. The The muscle endurance and time under tension here was like way more than I than I expected or ever did before. Did you pay as much attention to volume? Um, when I would when I would look at volume, volume was always the thing that I would adjust the most mm -hmm. um given if like i was cutting weight I was gaining weight close to competition far from competition we would adjust it and then each week it would adjust i would do i would do a good job between uh, myself and with burley's help mm -hmm. as well of uh adjusting the volume as need be but i never had that amount of volume i never saw like 
once I added up how much volume I got on sleds, once I added up how much volume I got on belt squat marching, once I saw how much volume I got on carries, I was like, holy shit, that's more volume than I got in two workouts. Mm -hmm. And this is a warm up to a workout. Like, I'm really, is this it? Like, is this how much volume I'm supposed to get? And how am I looking at these numbers where I have a quarter of a million pounds of volume, but I don't feel like I got hit by a bus? I mean, I'm sore. I feel like I worked out, but I don't feel like I got hit by a bus. You know, yeah. there's a big difference when I add up my volume from doing heavy squats and the heavy deadlifts and the heavy uh, high pulls and things like this. And I'm like, man, I lifted 48,000 pounds today. And like, I feel like dudes just hit me in the back with baseball bats. Yeah. You know what I mean? So I never paid attention to that. And I never, ever, ever maximized um, my accessory and my, my training. My accessory training was to get stronger and to help out my my main lifts and the muscles that I needed to to uh, develop, but it was never uh, an emphasis like it is here. Has it changed your perception of what Dante, the physical competitor, can achieve now? Like, do you believe now that your limits have raised because you can access more of your body? Honestly, uh, there w there was a time where. I didn't think that that these things would be possible. There was a time beginning when I worked out here that I looked at the workout and I was like, these guys got to be fucking nuts. This isn't happening. There's no way. You know, these this dumbbell for this many reps or this weight for this many reps into this, uh, that's not happening. Um, but then it would happen. You know what I mean? And then the next week, if the, if the number changed, I'm like, man, come on, no way, dude. Mm -hmm. And then it would happen, you know? And uh, you guys know me. If something was too much, I would definitely mm -hmm. tell it. You know, I'm not gonna, I, I'm not gonna complain, but I'm not gonna like paralyze myself yep. to not complain. You know, so it was crazy to see that those numbers were achievable. The volume was achievable. Um, I could actually finish these kind of workouts. Whereas before, when I was left to my own devices, I never would have. You know, and I never would have would have uh, thought that I could do. Um, just for example, you know, three by 30 on a bamboo bar bench after I did dynamic effort mm -hmm. bench and all this other work. I never thought three by 30, what do you fucking not, three by 10 if you leave it mm -hmm. up to me, you know what I mean? So, yeah, that's why it's 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 paid huge to be here and, and to have s people who understand it to a point that's a lot better than you. So now I'm starting to understand my body a little more. And now I'm starting to understand what I am actually capable of and what I actually can handle. And seeing each week in each training phase, it's increasing and it's getting more and more and more. It's really exciting to think about where it's going to end up in our next two, three, four, five years together. Mm -hmm. You know, um, I want to have another uh, 10 to 15 years in my career and I want to have another 10 to 15 years here. So it's exciting now to sit and look at, all right, I'm not on three by 10 or three by 12 for three years. I'm literally, I don't know where the fuck I'm going to end up. This is going <laughs> to be wild. You know what I mm -hmm. mean? So, and by the time it gets to that point, I'm going to be so strong and so uh, capable of things that I never imagined. So it is a really exciting thing. And it is a really cool thing that I never would have realized if I was left to my own devices. The, like, I appreciate everything you say. The, uh, kind of why I'm digging into this is I'm very intrigued at people's interpretation of our system. Um, and it's always the nuances, the little things, everyone picks up the general stuff. And it's to where when you study from someone's interpretation, you're, you've, you've taken it from the book, you've passed on your interpretation to it, then they go, well, this is, this has got to be it. Mm -hmm. And then suddenly the nuances get forgotten. Yeah. Right. And it's trying to, uh, trying to show people like you study, you learn from the masters, then you take it, put it into your sport, you adjust it to make it fit. But there's still the nuances is where it's, it's critical. It's, it's very true. And then when I go back and I look at some of these videos where, uh, you know, Louis talking about, you know, we pull a sled all the way around the building. We put this many plates on the sled, we pull it all the way around the building. We do this, we do that. And I'm like, yeah, we probably did. Whereas before I'm hearing them say this and I'm like, I don't know what the fuck he's talking about. You know what I mean? <laughs> yeah. Like, I don't know what he's talking about, what he means, if he ever did that, or why he's talking about it. But now I'm like, okay, I get it. 
I get it. That is a rest day. You're right. Walking 400 meters with a sled. Yeah, that is just GPP. Mm -hmm. That is what he would call GPP. Things like this. Safety squat bar walking, different little things that you would just literally like watching it just either skip over or that would just be blank to you. Um, now you start to be like exactly what you said, the nuances of it, the little little nuggets that you missed before until you come under uh, the roof where it was invented and you're like, okay, this is what it is. And are you able to take this now and even improve upon how you are teaching students strength training? Yeah, I think, I think it gets a little difficult for me right now because I think my level of, of strength and conditioning has increased so much that I can't give somebody my workout right now that I train with mm -hmm. because it's just not going to make sense. You know, one, they, I don't train with anybody who does my numbers as far as strength, mm -hmm. but as far as my volume now, I've kind of reached a point where I'm a lot way ahead mm -hmm. of pretty much the other guys on my team, you know, and that's not to talk shit. That's just because I just do it more and I've done it longer and I have better um, training, but um, I am able to kind of give people an idea of like, no, th I, this is what we might've thought it was, but this is what it actually is. You know mm -hmm. what I mean? Like, and it's not, it's not like, uh, it's not super discouraging to them because it's not that far off. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? Like, no, no, you don't need to change anything. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. You just, it's the same, it's the same shit. We're doing the same thing. We just need to do a little more of A, B, or C. Yeah. It's going to be harder for a little while, but pretty soon we're going to really enjoy it because again, like I said, when you start working out and you're a beginner, and you go to the gym for three weeks, then you see a vein in your bicep or you see yourself getting a little bigger, you're going to keep working out. That's really cool to you. You know mm -hmm. what I mean? Then when a chick or a dude tells you, hey, man, you, you, you look good, man. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you're getting a little bigger. Yeah, you're going to do it. So like when you see this thing, you start doing this thing that's difficult and then it becomes easier and then your numbers increase and you get stronger and then you look. My, my, my physical appearance is different even though my weight is the same. And mm -hmm. even at a time where my weight was going down, my strength was going up. I mean, when I was training here um, from late October to early December to do Nogi Worlds, I lost 19 pounds or about 19 pounds to make a, a new division for mm -hmm. Worlds. My strength was increasing. I was getting better. I was getting better times on different exercises. I was getting uh, using heavier weights for reps. I was getting better numbers on my max effort sets even though my weight was going down and my body was literally changing. Now that I've put some weight back on, I'm back at my natural weight. I can see things that are different. I can see my shoulders are built differently. I can see my back built different. My quads, my hamstrings are more developed. Um, that's motivating. That's motivating. Yeah. You know what I mean? That shit keeps you coming back. If you keep doing three by 10, 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 nothing changes. Your strength doesn't change. Your appearance doesn't change. Your mood doesn't change. Pretty soon you're not going to do it anymore. You're not really going to want to do it. And you're not going to put any kind of passion in it, you know? So even though when I see certain exercises that I, I just absolutely hate, I'm so motivated to come and train because, you know, it's that, yeah. it's, it's a, it's a cool thing. I get a rush out of it, seeing the, the strength go up and seeing my body change and seeing the difference on the mat as well. What, um, you brought it up, which is a very valid an important point is your feedback to us mm -hmm. that's what expedites training yeah if it's a one-way street well no one's going to learn and uh circling with with john quint your first few weeks here we're working on specific things the progress you made in three weeks can only be done from someone who's taking advice giving back advice and you're doing your stuff outside of here, right? Mm -hmm. And as you Absolutely. know, there's some professional athletes you can give them stuff to do and you know they're not going to do it. Mm -hmm. So that goes to having a high training age. You understand the professionalism in and outside of where you're at. Yeah. And if I can give any advice to athletes is that to give feedback, to go, hey, you can it's very important to question yeah because the higher your education is like i want you to be smarter than me in the gym because you know your body better than i do 
So if you're giving me feedback and then you're giving John feedback and then we're getting objective and subjective feedback at the same time, well, we can tailor in to asking the right questions, going to, well, how did you lose body weight and increase strength? Because we knew what strength to increase. Mm -hmm. It doesn't mean we're talking about your your bench press is going up. Yeah. No, it's very specific. We knew to ask the right questions to get the right answers. Absolutely. And that comes from athletic feedback, which I think ties into that's what a professional athlete does. Yeah, for sure. The, like you don't get your for hand sure. held. You have to give feedback in order for us to do a better job for you. Yeah, 100%. Because you need, if you want to get the most out of all those things that we just talked about, you have to be communicative you know squeaky wheel gets the grease kind of mm -hmm. thing if you're not doing that if you're just trying to or you're kind of following um the same kind of thing as somebody who just goes to a gym and gets a, a workout on a spreadsheet and they just scroll through it and when something's too hard for them they just mark down that they did it but they use 35s instead of 50s or they do 10 reps instead of 15 like they were supposed to do um i get to come back and be like look you said 12 and I can't <laughs> fucking do 12. You yeah. know what I mean? And I'm not, you know that I'm not somebody who's like, oh, okay, yeah, you couldn't do 12, bro. Yeah. yeah, whatever. You know what I mean? So it's super important. Um, I think the longer that we've been together and the more that we are together, the the more accurate training is going to get. You know yeah. what I mean? You're going to, we start to understand. Already I see that we start to understand um, numbers, percentages, and things like that specific to me way, way better. You mm -hmm. know what I mean? There's no, there's nothing's, there's barely ever any mistakes because these things, it's like, it's, it's to me, it's based off of my training, my numbers and what I'm doing in my life and what I'm doing in my career. And, uh, it's based off science. It's based off tried and true methods. So yeah, there's not a lot of uh, room for error, but whenever there is, or whenever you're struggling with something, if I'm not saying anything, um, I'm doing a disservice to myself. Dante, appreciate it. Thanks, Tom. <laughs>